In this life, we are told to be aware and careful of all kinds of monsters and threats that surround us. We're talking about an incredibly large array of dangers. Everything from catching a cold to venomous snakes, extreme temperatures and large predators. As a result, we know a thing or two about staying safe from these countless menaces. We wear jackets when it's cold and drink a lot of water when it's too hot. We stay away from snakes and wild bears. We wear our seatbelts and look both ways before crossing the street. We don't try to pet tigers and lions, and overall, we do our best to keep our bodies safe and away from danger. But what about those threats that nobody warned us about? What about the kind of monsters that come knocking on your door, completely uninvited and unprompted? And here's the worst part. If you didn't know how to avoid this particular danger, how could you possibly know how to fight it? On the first floor of an old apartment building downtown lived a young woman named Laura. When she chose her place of residence, avoiding inexplicable threats and protecting herself from unknown monsters weren't things exactly at the top of her list of priorities. But she did consider the benefits of living somewhere she was surrounded by other people. Kind people, friends and neighbours. Her grandmother always used to tell her that neighbours were the best friends you could possibly have. Your best friend that lives on the other edge of town or across the country could be extremely loyal and fun and honest. But who are you really going to call? Who are you genuinely going to turn to first when your house catches fire? Who's going to be the person that knocks on your door or calls the police and makes sure you're still alive? Fortunately for Laura, most of her neighbours happened to be exactly the kind of friendly people she had hoped for. Most importantly, they were the people she was going to need very soon. Absolutely nothing about Laura's apartment made her fear she could be a victim of any dangers that went beyond her imagination. She had learned to be aware of things like faulty pipes, burning the kitchen, and even robbers. She protected herself against these dangers as well as she could. But there were things that she very simply could have never found a way to protect herself from. Everything started with a simple glance out the window. The sun was setting, and Laura had a long day at work. She arrived home, dropped her bag by the door, picked up a glass of cold water in the kitchen, and, when she was making her way to the bedroom, she stopped briefly by the window in the hallway and frowned. There was a little boy across the street staring directly at her apartment, her window, at her. She immediately felt unsettled. Well, there was something odd about that little boy, but she didn't want to find out exactly what it was. This only inspired her to walk away from the window much faster. This was a big and busy city, and that strange boy certainly wasn't her problem. Or so she thought. Laura continued going through her nightly routine as if nothing had happened. She did a truly good job at wiping that uneasy memory from her mind. If nothing else had happened, then Laura would have immediately forgotten about that strange boy outside. But, as it happened, she wouldn't be able to move on. Not after that terrible, terrible night. Before going to bed, Laura passed by the bathroom for a warm shower, but it didn't give her the relaxing effect she usually got. The reason was a very irritating sound going on and on as she showered. She couldn't figure out what it was until she was almost done with her shower. Somebody was throwing pebbles at a bathroom window. As if that wasn't concerning enough, Laura looked out the window and then she saw the truth. It wasn't pebbles. It was a little hand. Slender and shockingly pale little fingers tapping against the fogged window. The fingers were at the bottom of the window, as if they couldn't reach any higher. Laura screamed and stumbled out of the shower so fast it was a wonder she didn't hurt herself in the process. 
unsettled and concerned about very real fears like regular stalkers and robbers, Laura rushed into her bedroom and got dressed hastily. She had planned to put on pyjamas, but halfway through she had opted for comfortable, casual clothes, having a distinct feeling that she wanted to run away, preferably not in her pyjamas. The reason was the feeling that she was being watched as she got dressed. Laura moved quickly, frantically, with a knot in her throat and tears prickling her eyes. Her body was covered in goosebumps and she was shaking. Who was watching? Why? How? Laura was so scared she didn't even want to turn around. But, inevitably, once she was dressed, she turned very slowly and saw them. Those eyes, those pitch black eyes stared at her and only her. There was only a crack between the curtains that covered her bathroom window, but it was more than enough. She saw them already. The young woman ran out of her apartment with tears brimming in her eyes. She felt confused, furious at this attempt against her privacy but it was impossible to shake that really disconcerting and unpleasant feeling she got when she looked into those impossibly black eyes. Laura had no interest in going out of her apartment to investigate. Instead, she rushed upstairs to her most reliable neighbour, a middle-aged couple that had always been nice to her. Laura knocked on their door frantically, and she was immensely relieved when the older woman opened the door and welcomed her into their home before asking any questions. Before Laura could figure out how to explain the strange experience and even stranger feeling currently seizing her heart, she was interrupted by a high-pitched, horrifying scream tearing through her own throat. She saw him. She saw him again. The same strange little boy with the pitch-black eyes. He was staring at them through the window. There was an even bigger problem. This apartment was on the third floor of the building, and there was nothing but empty space beyond that window. Laura screamed, closed her eyes, and stumbled backward until her back hit the closed door behind her. The married couple was fussing around her, trying to get her to calm down and explain what she saw. But when Laura opened her eyes and didn't see the black-eyed boy levitating outside the living room window, she only worried even more. She refused to believe she was crazy and seeing things that weren't there. But what other explanation was there? Then, suddenly, Laura felt and heard someone knocking on the door behind her. Three very slow knocks. Because Laura was leaning against the door, she could feel the pressure. The knocks came from the other side around the height of her waist. It was a little boy knocking at the door. She had no doubt about it. Slowly, Laura stepped back from the door. She was shaking so badly, but her face suddenly looked so pale, so devoid of any emotion other than fear. She couldn't even meet her neighbor's eyes, but she said, Look through the peephole if you want, but if on the other side of the doors there's a little boy, if he has pitch black eyes, no whites, no irises, no light, but just endless darkness, don't open the door. No matter what happens, don't open the door. Laura couldn't say anymore. She fell to the floor in the middle of the living room and started crying. It wasn't just how unsafe and watched and vulnerable she felt when she was alone, but it was how much worse it was when she realised the others saw them too. She was vaguely aware of the man looking through the peephole, and then convincing himself to open the doors that he shouldn't. Maybe the kid needs help, he told himself. Maybe he is sick or lost, he said. But when he opened the door, there was no sign of the kid. This should have been a good thing. He should have been able to move on from that. But he couldn't wipe from his mind the sight of those terribly and infinitely black eyes. That man would nearly go crazy that day, looking all over the building and the surrounding streets, looking for that pale, horrible little boy that scared him to death. 
but he needed to find an explanation for it. He thought he heard the little boy's quick footsteps, his shrill cold laughter, and those impossible and terrifying eyes watching him from every dark corner of the building. Meanwhile, his wife stayed in the apartment's living room, holding Laura in her arms and saying, It's okay. It's okay, sweetheart. Just don't look, okay? Don't turn around. Don't look out the window. They can't get it, okay? They can't get you. Just look at me, sweetheart. Don't look out the window. They can't get in. After a while, Laura wondered if the woman was trying to convince Laura or herself. Story 2 Superstitions, cryptids, paranormal beliefs. All of these things have evolved wildly through the years. It's not news that thousands or even hundreds of years ago, humanity used to think that perfectly normal and rational things were products of evil, gods or demons. With the help of science, we as a society have managed to move past many ancient fears. It would be unusual to find people still scared of lightning or eclipses. Science has gone as far as to try and reject so many more superstitions. Most people will probably say they don't believe ghosts are real. But are we 100% sure? There are still so many legends out there that could seem less plausible over the years, but have never been completely and certainly proved to be false. We are all very familiar with some of them. People all over the world could probably give at least a vague description of Bigfoot and what he probably is. But what about those myths that not only haven't been disputed by science, but that we don't even know about in their entirety? We are talking about incomplete myths, legends that are missing a few pieces of the puzzle, things that we have no name for, things that we are so far from understanding, and yet, the only thing we know for sure is that we have to fear them. This story comes from a man named Michael, although at the time he was just another lanky teenager, juggling anxiety and rebellion, insecurities and ambition, childhood and adulthood. Michael was 16 years old. And if he wanted to fit in with all the boys at school that were intensely focused on becoming men and breaking away from the comfort of overprotective parents and the rules that controlled them since they were kids, he had to take some risks. So, when he got invited to a party at a big country house on the outskirts of town and his parents refused to let him go, Michael took his chance. He decided he would not only sneak out of the house at night, but take his father's car and drive himself to the party. Hopefully, he would return home before his parents even noticed he was gone. If not, he would deal with the consequences afterwards and earn his reputation as a brave man with his classmates and friends. He had no idea that such goals would soon look so silly in comparison to bigger problems. He was about to discover the world was bigger more complicated and much darker than he imagined, while he worried about his high school social status. In the beginning, everything was perfectly fine. Well, Michael was sweating profusely and constantly looking over the rearview mirror expecting his parents to catch up with him. But other than that, everything was going according to plan. Until he left the city behind. The road was long, solitary, and not very well lit. Michael started driving slower, afraid of the solitude and the possibility of something happening to his dad's car. But then, not even five minutes after leaving the city behind, he saw them. There were two skinny little kids on the side of the road. They were looking at the ground, but they had their pale little arms stretched in front of them, holding up their thumbs asking for a ride. Michael felt his heart clench in his chest at the sight of those poor kids in need, but he knew that he couldn't make himself park the car for them. 
Michael understood that his priority was to cause as little trouble as possible. He had to stick to his plan at all costs. And his plan was very simple. Borrow the car, go to the party, and return home before his parents noticed his absence. Picking up stray kids was not part of the plan. They could bring dirt into the car. They could bring trouble. They could be part of a scheme to rob him or hurt him of any kinds of awful things. With this thought in mind, convinced that it wasn't normal to see kids abandoned on the other side of the road at night, Michael drove away. Driving away, however, wasn't as easy as the young man thought at first. As it turned out, just when Michael drove past the children, these two kids raised their heads so sharply, so quickly to stare at Michael, that the poor teenager jumped in surprise in his seat and the car swerved dangerously on the road. One other lonely car honked at him, but thankfully, he thought, other than that car, he was mostly alone on that road. Soon, he wouldn't think that was such a lucky thing at all, but quite the opposite. So, once his surprise was gone, Michael tried to look through the rearview mirror, check on the car that nearly crashed against him, and check on the kids that he left behind on the side of the road. But this time, he was so terrified, so shocked that an actual scream burst out of him. There was nothing visible in the rearview mirror except for two pale kids with expressionless faces and pitch black eyes staring right at him. Michael hit the brakes, closed his eyes, prayed to God his demise wouldn't hurt too much, and he waited. He waited and waited for the inevitable crash, or the cold hands around his throat, a knife, a gun anything to signal his death. But nothing came. Carefully, he opened his eyes slowly and realized that, since there were no other cars behind him on the road, no one crashed against him. In fact, there was nobody around to realize he got scared out of his skin and was made to park his car hastily in the middle of the road. At first, Michael was relieved. He took several deep breaths to try and calm his own heart. He waited for a minute or so until he felt at least mildly capable of driving again. He still didn't see any other cars coming from either direction, but it was undeniable that this was an unsettling experience. Michael couldn't erase those kids from his mind. Was he seeing things? Was he going crazy? Was this the result of the extreme anxiety caused by breaking his father's rules by taking the car? Either way, one terrible fact remained. When he looked through the rearview mirror to try and spot the kids that scared him so badly, Michael saw absolutely no trace of them. Well, Michael thought, this was a sign to move on to stop thinking about that random scare and try to return to his carefully planned night. And there was only one problem, and a very serious and terrible one at that. The car wouldn't start. No, 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 Michael whispered again and again as his voice grew more and more desperate. This couldn't be happening to him. Not that night out of all nights. Not when he had a party to get to, parents to avoid, and a disturbing memory of two creepy children to wipe off his memory. But there was nothing he could do about it. The car simply wouldn't start, and he feared that he had ruined something vital when he pulled on the brakes so violently. Hesitantly, Michael got out of the car. He didn't know much about cars, but he felt compelled to check under the hood of it. Perhaps the problem would be so blatant as an obviously loose cable that even he could fix it. But, less than five minutes later, he had to admit defeat. Partially because he was more than clueless about the car's motor. Mostly because he had company. He raised his eyes from the car when he suddenly felt observed. And he wasn't wrong. 
out of nowhere he saw the two kids again. This time they were walking right down the middle of the road. They were about a block away from Michael, and he hadn't even seen them approach him, but they were undoubtedly walking towards him. He felt uneasy and unsafe. This couldn't be good. He was unsettled by the strange children, but he still thought they were most likely tools of dangerous men seeking to attack helpless drivers in the middle of the night. Michael tried to keep calm. He looked around him, willing any car to please drive by. Please provide him help. Please just remind him that he wasn't alone in that dark and cold world with those mysterious children. But absolutely nobody would come. That couldn't be right. That couldn't be normal. It was just Michael, the distant lights along the road, and the two creepy kids coming closer and closer. Michael got back inside his car again and pretended to be brave. He tried to restart the car again and he was thoroughly unsuccessful. He locked all the doors and pulled out his phone to ask for help. His fingers were trembling and he forced himself to skip past his parents' numbers. He tried calling his best friends, but they were all at the party. He was all alone and possibly doomed from the start. Then he heard it, the first tap against the passenger's window. Can you give us a ride? A shrill and impossibly cold but childlike voice asked him. We are just trying to get back home. A different, slightly older and feminine but still deeply unnerving voice said. She was tapping the window on the back next to the passenger side. We're looking for our parents. Can you help us? The first voice said again, much closer this time, tapping the back seat window right behind Michael. He closed his eyes tightly and lowered his head. He gripped the steering wheel with all his might. He felt hot tears trickle down his face, and he was weak. When he heard someone tap on the closed window, he looked up, and there was nobody there. Can you help us? The children asked him. Michael looked up at the rearview mirror and saw a little boy and a little girl sitting side by side in the back of his father's car. They weren't smiling. They showed absolutely no emotion, but their horrifyingly dark eyes were more than enough to make Michael scream desperately once more, scream so loudly he couldn't remember stopping. All Michael really remembered was waking up with a start when he heard someone knock on his window again. This time it was a police officer. The sun was rising and the police had gotten complaints about a badly parked car in the middle of the road. Michael was cold, his body was stiff and sore, and he had a few drops of blood on his clothes and upper lip due to a nosebleed, probably. He didn't dare explain it all to the officer, and insisted he fainted unexpectedly on his way to a party. He didn't tell his friends, and he didn't share all the details with his own parents either. In fact, Michael's encounter with the black-eyed children remained a secret until now. Story 3 It is well known by now that humans experience fear and anxiety for good reasons. They are feedings that keep us alert and prepared to face danger and possible threats. Of course, nowadays, it's unlikely that we will have to deal with wild predators out on the street but the feelings remain. It's instinctual for humans to look for safety and to protect themselves, their loved ones, and their homes. This explains why people are wary of letting strangers into their homes, why we have peepholes on our doors, and why we lock our front doors behind us and double-check they're locked every night. No, we aren't talking about the feral predators that our ancestors had to deal with. And it's not exactly about regular sources of stress in everyday modern life. The real problem here is the kind of monsters that deny time and space, 
faith and reason, logic, and everything we thought we knew. In this case, we're dealing with a very specific type of creature, which not even believers fully understand yet. How could one expect somebody completely ignorant of the legends, the bad signs, and his own vulnerability to have even been prepared to deal with the black-eyed children? The story begins with a young man named Gabriel fighting for his life long before he first encountered these mysterious and undeniably dangerous creatures. Gabriel was a history student at college, and he had made it through four years of college dealing with a lot of stress and hard work and not having nearly as much fun and excitement as everyone always talked about. However, nothing could have prepared him for the extreme anxiety he would feel while trying to write his thesis, the last necessary step to fulfil before he could finally graduate and complete that lifelong dream that would finally set him free. The whole process was especially gruelling for Gabriel. He was losing sleep, losing weight, losing his social life, and some would say he was losing his sanity, obsessing over his investigation and how difficult it was turning out to be. Every time he had to meet his thesis advisor in his office, he would feel sick for a few days before and after. Every other week, it was the same. Gabriel would get out of bed after a sleepless night, spend the entire day obsessing over the work he'd managed to get done, barely eating and talking to anyone else, and at the end of the day, at the scheduled time, he would take the bus that would drop him as close as possible to the building where his thesis advisor would meet with him for an hour or so. With so many problems already, such as a scattered mind and tremendous levels of anxiety, who could have blamed Gabriel for failing to realise he was stepping into the path of a threat much more deadly than college work? The campus wasn't very crowded at that time of day. If anything, Gabriel encountered the most people leaving the place at the same time that he was barely coming in. It wasn't all that strange to see loners hanging behind, waiting for their friends, or just taking their time for themselves before going back home for the day. However, it was a little difficult to miss a really odd case. Gabriel, distracted and stressed as he was, didn't manage to miss the sight of a little girl walking by herself on the alleys between the tall buildings of the campus. It was so strange that perhaps if he had been in a different state of mind, at a different stage of his life, Gabriel might have reached out to the little girl or called for help. As it happened, he felt in such a hurry and so troubled by his own personal problems that he ignored the little girl. It's unclear if this made things better or worse for him. Gabriel stumbled inside the building where his thesis advisor had an office on the top floor. As always, the old building creeped him out. It was mostly deserted at that time of day. It was cold. The hallways were too long. Protesters had stolen about half of the light bulbs, and there was a mild to severe problem with bats taking over the ceiling of the top floors of the building. Gabriel rushed up the stairs, forgetting that his anxiety gave him an uncomfortable pressure in his chest that made it difficult for him to breathe, and as a result, he was light-headed and exhausted barely halfway through. He had to stop on the stairs to regain his breath, and that meant he took a moment to look around him, distracted. This time, he wasn't so surprised to see that strange little girl again. She was probably looking for one of her parents who probably worked until late in that building. What Gabriel found surprising was how unsettling the sight of that girl was. She walked so slowly, almost swaying on her feet, acting aimless and lost. She was incredibly pale, Gabriel noticed even from afar, and her dress was old-fashioned, even torn in places, and a little dirty. He didn't want anything to do with that little girl. That's why he started walking briskly again as soon as he realised the little girl was turning toward the stairs where he was standing. Gabriel hurried up as much as he could to reach the top floor of the building. He couldn't hear footsteps behind him and yet he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being followed. Purposefully, he avoided looking back. But that only made him more certain that there was something terrible behind him. But, at least, 
he finally reached his destination. And that was when he saw the note his thesis advisor left on the door. He had had a personal emergency, and they would need to reschedule for another day. Gabriel didn't even get to enjoy the feeling of relief at being spared another day before facing his overwhelming project. All he could focus on was the inkling that he couldn't be caught alone in that lonely hallway, where the door to the office was locked, and when he turned around, the girl was just entering the hallway. Gabriel nearly gasped, but decided to try and at least appear unfazed. For all he knew, that was a perfectly normal, quiet, ominous little girl. Right? Well, the lights flickering on the ceiling above him dared to object. He tried to explain it all away. It was just the missing light bulbs. Nothing to worry about. But he couldn't, for the life of him, get his heartbeat under control. The long, dark hallway with the flickering light and dirty floors because of the bats fluttering in the corners of the ceiling. It was all too much. Gabriel rushed to the next door along the hallway, but it too was closed. He kept going, trying one door after the other while the girl slowly but surely got closer to him. The lights started flickering even faster, and one of the few remaining light bulbs exploded above him. Gabriel grasped, but then he finally reached an unlocked door. Gabriel yanked open the door, but then he made the mistake of glancing over his shoulder. He looked back just in time to see the little girl reach out for him and raise her head. That was when he saw her eyes. He couldn't believe it. It couldn't be true. It didn't make sense and it defied everything he knew about biology and the human body. But this little girl's eyes, they were the darkest thing he had ever seen. There wasn't a trace of light in them. The white of her eyes was completely missing. The entire eyeball was a profound and inscrutable black mass. But even without pupils and irises, Gabriel could tell the girl was staring directly at his eyes. It was the most horrible feeling he had ever experienced being under the scrutiny of those impossible eyes. Gabriel reacted just in time, just a second before the girl's little hand grasped his arm. He sneaked inside the empty classroom and quickly closed and locked the door behind him. He rested his back against the door, as if that could make the door more solid and protect him. But only after a few seconds of struggling to breathe, he finally felt three soft knocks on the door. Can I come in? The girl asked with a sweet and childish voice that Gabriel only found unsettling. He came up with an excuse and denied her access, but the girl insisted. Please, I'm looking for my parents. This time the words came accompanied by harder knocks on the door. Worried, Gabriel stepped back and watched as the door started to shake. I need to come in. The girl insisted, and then, to Gabriel's utter shock, the knocks on the door turned so aggressive that he could see the door shake wildly on its hinges. It was as if a couple of adult men were kicking it as hard as possible. Quickly, Gabriel pushed a desk in front of the door and got as far away from it as he could. He was crying, he could feel an ache in his chest, and he could barely breathe. He fainted as soon as he heard the wood of the door starting to crack. Fortunately, the security guard of the campus arrived soon after. He had heard Gabriel screaming and made his way there to see what happened. As expected, the security guard and no other person stood on campus ever saw the little girl come in, chase Gabriel, and leave without a trace. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I know there is a ton of content out there, and I'm sincerely appreciative for you watching this right through to the end. If you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit the like button. And if you don't already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and select the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future uploads. Also, please leave a comment on this video and let me know what you thought of it. Comments really help with the YouTube algorithm and will really help my channel to grow.
You can also let me know what type of videos you would like to see more of on this channel. That really helps me branch out into new subject matters. If you have a story you would like me to tell on this channel, please email it to me at stories at daredevil.com. If you want to support my channel even further, there are a number of ways you can do so. You can buy me a coffee via my coffee account, or simply help me out by sharing my content with anyone you might think is interested in watching it. Thanks again.